for those of us who are not Native people, what would your advice be for trying to form or build relationships with Indigenous leadership in your community? I believe some of that is standardized protocols. I really do. It's communication. It's caring. Every one of these partnerships that you see started with trust, building trust, reaching out, communicating. I know Jen is a firm believer that we get strange bedfellows when we do this work, and we do need to talk across the aisles. We do need to talk to the people that we don't usually talk to. And then really remember that all of you are indigenous to some place on this globe. All of you are indigenous to some place on this earth. And the last thing we saw there, ceremony, a honoring ceremony, somewhere in your ancestry, you are a singing and a drumming and a dancing society somewhere. So I would advise everybody to really uh, dig deep into your own cultural awareness because once you understand yourself and your own strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which we all have to do and get real about, then we come to a place, a baseline of where we're at in our community. And it is all built upon communication and, and real relevant assistance of what we can bring and, and realizing that we all have different strengths and talents and abilities and knowing that we all need each other in these crises. I said last year at this time, we had our 9-11, we had our crisis. Our villages were burnt out in the same places the villages today are getting burnt out. And you all have this group of people, fires bringing us back together again. You all have this group of people and this support system to help you. Our people didn't have that. And our people are being asked now to provide those answers and still be those generous people that provide this knowledge, share this knowledge so that we can all have a better community. Hopefully, we can take care of our earth a little better than we have and then work together better than we have in the past. It shouldn't take a crisis to bring us to this place. We should be doing this every day in our community because we are connected to the land and we are healthier and happier when we are connected to each other and connected to the land that provides our subsistence. So obviously the, the federal government and even state uh, governments have a trust responsibility, a legal trust responsibility with tribes. But thinking about community-based organizations, you know, nonprofits or um, collaborative consortiums of people that are forming around issues, especially around natural resources, fire, um, ecosystem resilience, and even recovery, uh, is that effort to have a seat at the table, many seats at the table for tribal organizations, tribal governments, or departments. Yeah, um, it takes that focused effort and that commitment to do that. And we've done that since our inception through reaching out to, to, the, to the communities, including those communities within our organization, hiring uh, within our organization. I think we have seven tribes represented within our organization, and establishing memorandums of, of understanding, um, forming and developing those relationships through collaborative processes. So we form the Intertribal Ecosystem Restoration Partnership, because for those of you who are familiar with forest collaboratives that are trying to address the fire issue and the issue of forest resilience, tribes have not been invited to the table, and oftentimes tribes have to impose themselves so as an organization, even with the NEPA process or CEQA, is when a project idea first comes into somebody's mind for a proposed action, the first people to reach out to are the tribes of the area. And then form the other relationships after. Because as many of our um, friends and relatives will say, it's all ancestral lands regardless of whose name is currently on it, whether it's private lands, federal lands, or even tribal trust lands. And there's complexities there, but uh, there's really good strategies to do that. And uh, I think we're proud to have set an example, working with many tribes in this space and influencing the federal agencies now on a, one project in particular where there was an idea for a proposed action, uh, a 20,000 acre project to do restoration work. And the Forest Service contacted Lomakatsi and we contacted the Pitt River Tribe. And at the first meeting, the tribe was at the table and giving their input so how they want that project to be implemented, what resources they care about. So there's different ways to do it. Um, it's not a, a, a book on it, but um, I think just that effort is the first step and knowing where, where, what land you're on. 
So one one of the issues I raised that we've 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 encountered is that our, the territory of, of Pepperwood is Michoel Wapo Dry Creek Pomo Wapo territory. Michoel people are not a federated tribe. So how would you? What advice would you give for negotiating working with non federated tribes, federated tribes? And could you explain a little bit for folks who might be new to that concept how that works? So for non-federally recognized tribes, Lomakasi works with all tribes, even the non-federally recognized tribes like the Shasta Nation, the Modoc Nation, uh, the Wintu Winnemum. So it's really important to for us as a nonprofit to not draw those lines jurisdictionally and say we can't work with you, we can't fund you because you're non-federally recognized tribes. We bring them in. For our Pitt River tribe, who is federally recognized, we actually cover those non-federally recognized tribes in the work with the uh, water and the State Water Quality Control Board. The Pitt River Tribe actually covered the Modoc Nation, the Wintu Winnemum, and the Shasta Nation to come to the State Water uh, Board and get the policy changed for cultural beneficial use, for recognizing that water should be allocated to fish and wildlife also along with subsistence. So that's how we work together with tribal nations. And I think it's really important that as Marco stated, there is a trust responsibility for all this federal funding comes down to consult with tribes. So the federal money is obligated, mandated to consult with tribes. The state has some policies now and new orders within this state that recognizes, uh, I think it's uh, B-1011. If I remember right, it's been a while since I've been out of California, but under um, Governor Brown, I believe we got that um, Senate or executive order B-1011 in California. So all of natural resources, California state needs to consult with tribes. And how that's done has been a mystery to a lot of our partners. However, when our tribes can sit down with the state and federal agencies and our tribal leaders and the opinion leaders in our communities can all sit down together, that's, those, that's the space that we want to create. So um, knowing what those laws are, and that can get kind of boring, but you have partners who know those laws, and then knowing what your state, your federal, your local agencies can do and then how can tribes help uh, co-invest in this planning? I think that's a um, not being so diverse and uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, not having that diversity at the table really decreases our knowledge in the room. And so when you can think about it like that, when you have tribes there, like Marco was saying, you have so much more leverage of federal consultation. Tribes can do what the state can't do, what the locals can't do. And then those non-federally recognized tribes can come under the umbrella of those federally recognized tribes. I know my grandfather started in the state of California, the Intertribal Council of California, and that's our lobby. And so that's about 40 years old organization that is doing different things now, but that's where about 40 tribes came together with resolution that can actually delegate a tribal organization such as Lomakatsi to be able to work on their behalf or be a voice on their behalf or delegate us on their behalf to go and speak, go negotiate, form agreements, and be able to um, be included in that decision-making process and implementation of these best practices that we perform. Um, once again, the, the collaborative uh, teams that we work with um, and I know the federal government is also, um, was, they have a responsibility to consult with tribal interests, not just federally recognized tribes. Um, some of the non-federally recognized tribes that we work with are, are legally recognized. They have a legal recognition through various court orders that they um, did exist on the landscape. Um, the whole politic of federally and non-federally, there's a lot with colonization and confederated tribes being lumped together, but um, we won't get into that, but just the opportunity to think about that one slide Belinda shared where you have the tribal elders in the community, you have a federally recognized tribes, natural resource departments, fire shops, non-federally recognized tribes, and the tribal community, and then tribal economic development corporations that we can um, operate uh, within um, different spaces to, to get this work done on, done on the ground. In a, in a collaborative consortium. And uh, we're, we are gonna take questions in a second, but I got a little extra time on the clock, so I'm gonna take my 
privilege of getting to ask a couple more and then open it up. Um, I loved in the video how you talked about the marriage of, I'm not exactly the exact words, but of Western science, what I would call Western science and indigenous science. And a lot of what we do at Pepperwood is elevate indigenous knowledge to really indigenous science. But tell me how that works for you. What, what have been the opportunities? What do you find the constraints? And what's the right way to talk about it? Well, I always say, and I think I said it last year here, is we get the big I told you so award because we did it right. We are the first best stewards of the land, and we use fire as a land management tool. But that's not all. Uh, we were teasing around earlier about we need a Department of Common Sense back in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we do, and, and that's uh, a lot of... Um, what we see, our, our elders will tell us very simple truths, like, like know who you are, um, fire brings us together, uh, being able to celebrate in the way that you saw those rituals, those ceremonies. And I think that's really important for all of us because uh, not just our people have lost their way in being connected to the land. We see that happening with our families everywhere. And I will get on my soapbox for one minute here and say the beast that we're wrestling for the hearts and the minds of our children is technology. Technology does help us. It helps us do all this. It helps us be here. However, it is something that we struggle with, with the minds and the hearts of our children. And when we see these youth coming out on the land and getting a chainsaw in their hand and getting certifications to do all this work, we... Uh, go K through 12, and then we have 16 to 18 year olds, and then we have 18 to 30 year olds. And as we are educating them in these best practices in the Western science and teaching them about why they should be out here and that they really should be connected to the land, that makes them feel better than they've ever felt in school. And I asked them, when have you ever felt, and I'm not getting down on teachers here, but when have you ever felt that your spirit was nurtured in a classroom? And that's a really important question because most of the time, they not one of them says, I felt like my spirit was nurtured. Yeah, there might have been a good teacher that helped me out and believed in me. However, a spirit is a big part of us. I tell everybody it's like a belly button. Everybody has a spirit, and we need to be nurturing each other's spirits. We need to be talking life into each other. Those are the traditional values and the principles that we've separated ourselves from because we're in this hurry up techno digital world and I would encourage everyone to settle back into their own indigenous knowledge you all have it you all have it it's there it's in your DNA just like us maybe you've been separated from it a little bit longer than our people have but it's there and that's the connection that we need as people we're not techno creatures yet we're still biological people with needs for security communication approval a safe place to live a safe environment to grow and those experiences through our lifetime should impart wisdom to us. And that's what the traditional ecological knowledge is. We can have knowledge up here, but one of our elders says the longest road to travel is those 12 inches from your heart to your head. So this is the road that we need to travel all the time to have these conversations and to marry that heart with our knowledge so that what we do is really empowering and impactful. I have to say I love that description because as someone who, well, survived a Western PhD thesis, um, definitely it was a spirit breaker, <laughs> you know, I have to say. And I think, I think Western scientists really have a hard time um, acknowledging sort of their humanity and their spirituality because it, it does, um, it, it makes you seem less objective, right? And yet what I've found as a scientist working in this space is if you don't show up as a 100% human being in the work you can't you cannot really help people or connect with people or be part of the solution so i love that feedback did you have a sense on that too yeah so thinking about that the marriage when it comes to implementing a project on the ground or a large landscape scale project so we have great tools data set analysis or risk assessments um, both spatially geospatial tools and then we have the on the ground application. So we, we still need people on the land. So when we have these departed systems that haven't seen fire in 100 to 150 years, we've inherited a landscape that is really different than 
pre-colonial influence when fire was excluded. So we, we lean on those tools, but when we think about a reference system, what did this ecosystem look like prior to the removal of tribal fire and indigenous uh, caretakers? And as Belinda will say, uh, the keystone species, one of the keystone species is being reintroduced back into the ecosystem and it's people putting their hands on the land and stewarding the land. The concept of people and nature being separate is, it, it's kind of a new concept. So when we think about the Western science and the marriage with iTech, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, it brings these two together in a way that can use that reference system. What did it look like prior? What are the practices? What are the different burn intensities? So if you think about you're on the landscape and you're, you're, you're the science of observation, how did lightning or, or fire burn through different vegetative conditions? And you're gonna replicate that. If I put fire on the ground in this intensity, I'm gonna get this result. If I wanna get firewood for my, my village, I'm gonna have to burn at a little higher intensity because I've watched 2,000 acres burn at a, at a mid intensity that kept the trees still on the stump, but killed them and they basil sprouted from the bottom. Then I can go up and I can gather those um, firewood resources. So the landscape was managed through mosaic patches in different burn intensities at different elevations for different resources. This land, even when you walk out, of, out here and you look at these oaks on the hill, it was carefully managed and the landscape was farmed with fire. It's an agro agroforestry practice. So we're leaning on that iTech to restore resilient ecosystems, but we, we have to marry that with the tools we have now because we are in a crisis. We're in a massive crisis across millions of acres. That's why we're all sitting here together. So I, I think that power of the two coming together and then restoration practice, which is the art. How do we lean on our science, our science teams and our, our tribal elders that are also scientists in a, in, a, in a traditional sense, the PhDs without a PhD, and the practitioners on the ground, you have a very powerful outcome. Reference condition, pre, current condition, post-ecological resilience, and climate adaptation, thinking about the future, because the landscape is different. That's such an important point, because we just helped a partner do a historical ecology analysis of this landscape, Sonoma County, and um, you know it looked really different at European contact, and these big dug fir forests that of course people have grown to love were not here in the extent that they were. And I think that's one of the things we wrestle with is how do you start to get people to be open to the fact that the future, our reference condition looks quite different from what we're living in now, and you have to let go of that attachment to what the newcomers thought, well, this is what it's supposed to look like, you know, but really around here it would be a lot more chaparral habitat, a lot more oak habitat that would have been on a very uh, frequent fire return interval. So, okay, with that, I'm gonna open it up because I know there's questions. Is that Tracy back there? Yeah? The next fires, enabling beneficial fire. And when they announced it today, they talked a lot about cultural fire and the importance of cultural fire and, and really working with our indigenous partners to be the leaders in this, which a lot of us in the wildland fire space know that that's, that's, that's our only hope, right? Uh, the Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission report, it was released today, it's called On Fire. If you Google Wildland Fire Management Commission, it'll come up. Um, so basically, given that, if you had one ask for the feds, because right now there's going to be a lot of attention on this, what would that ask be in terms of how to support cultural fire and, and supporting our indigenous partners as leaders in this? I know one of the things that California has done is uh, created Senate Bill 332, which authorizes us to, uh, by resolution, we can just appoint uh, cultural fire practitioners. And that's huge for tribes. I know for our tribe that's 12,000 acres up in Modoc County, the XL Reservation, um, folks were shut down and we were pile burning. And um, my son, who is on our tribal council, the Coastal Electa Tribal Council, Cal Fire came out and they said, well, we're not burning. And he says, well, this is a cultural fire, so go ahead and burn. So that's... Um, that's one of the things that we can do. I think Senate Bill 332 hasn't been fully realized. However, one thing that I know Marco 
says we can't just go in and light up the forest now because we have really horrible conditions in there. So everything that we do is really set in the stage. The ecological forestry has to happen, and that's where we've had um, issues in the past with environmentalists suing the Forest Service, not letting us do the work that we need to do out there. Maybe they don't understand that good fire needs to be on the land. So what happened was um, environmentalists started losing their forest. And then we started getting closer to talking of how are we going to not lose our forests anymore. But everything that we do and the ask that would be is for the, the money to go to work on the land to let us to do the ecological thinning that you saw from that picture of the unit that survived and being able to be strategic about how we put fire on the land and set the stage for good fire to come back. So the picture that you saw that was very telling had ecological thinning, had prescribed fire. So when the bootleg fire hit, the fire went right to the ground and did exactly what it was supposed to do. Even a month later when we were out there, it was still snaking around doing what it's supposed to do. So we need to be able to put the money to work on the land in, in strategic places like the Rogue Basin Strategy, know that we have to treat um, however many acres, the 20% of that land base in order to get the results that we want. So we need to follow best practices and we need to set the stage do the ecological thinning, do the prescribed fire, and then be able to go in there with the crew to put good fire on the land and be able to maintain the land base with that good fire. Once we get the heavy lift of getting a lot of those fuels out of there, we were just back in Boulder where I put it, uh, a lot of the feds think we need, uh, or the people that are making policy think we need to do reforestation. We do need to do reforestation, but a lot of the work that we need to do is the ecological thinning. And so that's where we start. And then being able to really empower tribes as those first best land stewards to come to the table in these collaborative forestry groups with these large landscape initiatives. And um, as we're invited, we can help co-invest. We can collaborate, we can plan, uh, we can co-manage and we can co-invest with our partners to be able to get this work done. Everything now is really trending towards home defensible space and um, protecting our homes, home hardening. And what we're trying to get to marry with that is the fact that we need to treat strategic ridgelines, we need to treat the forest in specific places so that we can protect communities when the fire does come. And so our fire marshals, our uh, tribes, um, our collaboratives, our forestry collaboratives, again, is that communication that we all have to talk to be able to do this work. But we can't go out there right now and, and light up the forest like we used to. Uh, and even the, uh, the ranchers, the farmers, knew this practice. So uh, if we go to talk to any of them, we had a big ranch down in Chico when I was growing up, and uh, Butte Creek, we used to graze our cows up in Butte Creek. And right now, when you're bringing your cows off of the forest, and cows aren't a great thing for the forest or the water systems, but when we were bringing the cows off, it was uh, lighting up the whole chaparral, all the hillsides as we brought the cows off. Uh, for the winter time. So those practices need to be included in our land management practices again. Hi, Tracy. Um, so thinking about uh, additional uh, workforce development, I think is a big part of how we can bolster cultural fire and centering indigenous uh, initiatives with tribal, tribal people. Um, there's some great efforts rolling out under the current administration. We're really fortunate. Uh, to have the Indian Youth Service Corps uh, rolled out by um, Secretary Holland, Deb Holland. Um, we're going to be leaning on that. And in the video you saw, a lot of it is, is building skill sets and building capacity in tribal communities, which there's some great examples in California of that happening and evolving examples in uh, the West. So I, I, I think um, to increase that cultural fire knowledge and uh, prescribed fire knowledge, uh, centering around a workforce development initiative is going to get us a lot of traction. We're, we're able to do that uh, as part of our program. The other part is um, diversifying the skill sets because cultural fire is, is uh, there's limited uh, operating periods to be able to do that. But if we're building a workforce that can do cultural and heritage surveys, Section 106 work like we're doing today in the MODOC, we have a whole tribal crew on the ground surveying for a 5,000 acre project. Um, encouraging our, our communities to go into higher education. We have an archaeologist on the ground. 
we're doing A to Z NEPA with the feds right now. The federal agencies um, are challenged with capacity. Some of our state partners are as well. So investing in community-based organizations, tribal organizations, NGOs to um, fill that capacity because we have 35% um, vacancies in the federal agencies right now. We have whole forests that don't have uh, NEPA teams, National Environmental Policy Act, to get this work ready. And I, I, re I realize it's beyond federal lands, it's state lands, it's trust lands, it's private non-industrial lands. But uh, what the feds can do to help cultural fire is invest holistically in what you saw in that video, a diversity of skills, so the crews can work all year. They're not make work programs that happen for a few months and then people go back to the unemployment line, but we're meaningfully engaging and meaningfully investing and building those skill sets, but also that cultural exchange that we see so well in the Mid Klamath with the Mid Klamath Watershed Council, the prescribed fire councils, um, the Karuk tribe and others, that peer to peer learning is a great model and we continue to see that in other places, continue to invest in those um, efforts. And in one closing comment, uh, there's a thing called Keystone Agreements that are rolling out under um, uh, uh, federal partnerships. And typically who are receiving these Keystone Agreements, Keystone Partners are uh, organizations, national organizations that can receive 200 to $300 million and obligate money across large landscapes. Tribes and smaller organizations are, are not being considered. So there's an equity issue, and we're, we're talking to our partners at the national level to think about how do we get that money to tribal communities or NGOs that work with tribes so we can bolster that capacity? How do we change the paradigm of how we're investing in those efforts uh, at the local, rural, and tribal community level? So do you have bandwidth to help advise on exporting this model? Because I think the workforce piece is so exciting. Is that something that you are able to help because you have such a successful model or how would you suggest if, if other tribes or tribal or tribally led organizations or indigenous led organizations want to do that? Is there resources to help get those started? Um, one of the things that we do is um, like Marco was saying, those agreements, uh, federal partners, uh, state partners, private philanthropy, the OCC was state funding that we helped uh, form the policy, Senate Bill 762 in Oregon, and then received five million of that to put on the ground. And two of those workforces you saw was, uh, one was tribal, the first tribal out the gate of that OCC program in Oregon. And again, I'm gonna emphasize best practices. So our crew starts out for 18 weeks. They start out with their first aid, their CPR, their incident command system, uh, 100, 200, and 700. Um, they get their chainsaw cert, their S212. They get their uh, wildland fire cert. They get their cultural monitoring cert. And as we speak right now, we're talking um, with a teacher back in the East Coast to get their Woofer, their uh, wilderness first responder, and then actually their CERT CERT, their community emergency response team CERT. So that really is a best practice replicable model that any town, any tribe, USA can implement. And it just takes people like yourself uh, just picking up the ball and making those phone calls, you can call us, but we can provide technical assistance. We can replicate this model, and that is what we're working on doing right now through the Indian Youth Service Corps. So the Indian Youth Service Corps, we can have, um, we're working on a Region 5 and 6 agreement with the USDA. You can also get this agreement through the DOI, where it was first introduced, and that enables us to train, equip, and empower um, the 18 to 30 year olds and if you're a veteran up to 35 and it also includes the rural and frontier community youth um, outside of our Native American youth and for those communities I think it's really important when you get to these rural communities to get our youth back out on the ground it's a very important work very replicable model and it is a best practice. And also the soft skills of positive youth development, most employers are saying that the youth coming into the workforce don't have the soft skills, the hard work, the dependability, the ability to communicate, 
the ability to own when they make a mistake. And so that soft skill of positive youth development and for young adults too is really important to integrate. So that is the best practice. Again, very replicable model and can put, be put down anywhere. So uh, thinking about your question around the scaling or, um, you know, we don't tribe shop. Um, you know, there, there, there are consultants and folks that go around and they, they try to create projects. We go where we're invited. Um, and there's some tribes that have a lot of capacity, hundreds of personnel and natural resource departments operating really um, high functioning programs. And then there's smaller tribes that request support um, and mid middle sized tribes. So um, it's really where we're, where we're invited and we're scaling to meet the need right now and hiring more tribal leadership within the organization. Um, we're looking at some opportunities with the White Mountain Apache and relationships with the Ecosystem uh, Restoration Institute on how to replicate this model, but also provide the technical assistance to set people up for success in their own communities, both tribal and rural. Uh, the, the model can be replicated across different communities as well. So thinking about long-term, we, we need capacity. We need long-term capacity to, to address the fire crisis. It's not a, a, a one-size-fits-all. It's retrofit, as you know, in all your work. It's gonna be different with each community uh, and at the direction of that community and finding those community leaders. But the main part of what we're sharing, we're gonna actually have a intertribal summit in Sun River that was been requested by our tribal partners. What are the tools we have, the Tribal Forest Protection Act that uh, tribes can lean on? stewardship authority, good neighbor authority, these different authorities that we can piece agreements together, funding, philanthropic dollars, leverage millions of dollars, so it's not a make work program. We have a scope of work for a decade. People that are trained can then step into a career and implement and care for their landscape where they live and also go to support neighboring watersheds and neighboring communities as kind of a, a, a micro mobile workforce within a couple hour radius. So this, this is happening. There's other great examples. Uh, you might want to check out Ancestral Lands. There's a great group in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, <clears throat> a lot of different approaches in, in this space, but it takes collaboration with the feds, state, philanthropy, and other NGOs to get this work done on the ground and train a workforce. So I would like to open up, because there's, there's got to be questions from you in the audience. Questions around working with tribes, serving as an ally, yeah. Um, but maybe that's not the case. And so I'm kind of curious from a permit regulation standpoint, if we are, if you are seeing a, a mind shift in the ecological restoration mindset so that the permit process is easier and we can do this more places. Yeah, I think there's a lot of motion forward um, with, the, with the NEPA process and the analysis, uh, environmental analysis process that fire is part of the equation for ecological health. We're seeing some great examples of what we would call A to Z projects or cradle to grave where tribes are in the lead with non-government partners uh, in these NEPA documents and these analysis documents that fire has to be part of the equation if we're gonna have resilient landscapes. Um, there's a couple of examples of, in a forest service document that used to be really pretty dry, you have creation stories in there from the tribes. Uh, we're doing that with Belinda's band right now on an amazing project called Tiktaquia which is uh, a tribally named project working in the Modoc National Forest, where um, the analysis is around cultural fire. We're gonna analyze for not only prescribed burning, but cultural fire. And we're doing that through categorical exclusions. So a healthy forest categorical exclusion or a wildlife CE. Um, and then on uh, larger projects with full on environmental assessments, we're seeing a lot of great motion forward for a holistic ecological approach that cares for you know, the, the, the biological diversity of the system, wants to retain old growth uh, characteristics and get fire back on the ground while still removing, like that one photo you saw, 40 million board feet came out of that project. And back in the day, the environmental community would have been throwing lawsuits, but we've demonstrated we can bring the environmental community together because they care about the landscape. They've been some of great allies. They pushed the envelope back in the day when things were out of hand and clear cutting was, uh, just rolling through the landscape, and then we could bring industry partners to the table with their amazing skill sets of removing the biomass and the fuel, um, the, the logging community, and then the tribal community at the center 
So as these NEPA projects are developed, there's more, more win-win on the front end because of collaboration. So we're seeing great examples of that. And I would just add to that, uh, smoke is one of our regulatory compliance issues that we have all the time in, in the air. And I know with the Almeida fire in Oregon, uh, where we lost 2,500 homes, uh, we've been talking about trauma-informed care and uh, people that are survivors of that. But it takes that community license, that building that community uh, social license to be able to put smoke in the air, prescribe fire in the air after a fire that has devastated the community and people feel traumatized all over again. We got questioned, you know, why are you doing this to us, putting smoke in the air? And it really is, again, boiling down to common sense. It's like we're going to live with smoke. These were dry forests, you had frequent fire intervals. And so would you rather have us putting that prescribed fire on the ground now to help protect your community, to help protect your watershed? And just building the social license again is very close communication. Um, we are uh, very, very glad to have a past employee from Pepperwood, Tom Greco, communications director for Loma Kotze. We have to have a strong communications team. And that outreach and engagement happens all the time so that we're communicating with our people, we're communicating with our public, and they have the trust in us. And we've built that social license within the community to be able to put good fire back on the land and put smoke in the air. And they know that it's us helping the community. Like uh, Joe, one of our colleagues, was talking about that they know, the community of Chiloquin knows that good smoke's going up in those trees and helping disease. But we have to communicate that. We have to educate folks and we have to hold space for them to be able to communicate about what they've experienced and what they continue to experience with smoke in the air and then be working with our health care partners with everybody around to make sure the elders are taken care of that they have masks that they have everything that they need um, while we are doing those type of activities and also being careful with the people on the ground the more and more education that's why we're doing the wilderness first responder there's more and more EMTs needed out there because there's high risk for our firefighters and the people on the ground doing this work. Hi, my name is Harry Hubble. I'm with FireSafe Sonoma. I guess my question is more about the economics behind wh what you guys are doing. I spent some time in Southern Oregon and it felt like a lot of people my age living in these small towns, the only hope was to leave and go to a bigger town or a bigger city and try to find a better job. I was just wondering if y'all have seen any sort of tangible impacts economically through young people choosing to stay in these uh, communities that you guys are active in? Well, I think that's part of, uh, you know, the, there was a boom and bust era. Um, the big tree economy was what drove a lot of um, the last hundred years. I mean, even all these towns, the churches, the infrastructure were, were either built on agriculture or big tree logging, one tree log truck loads. Um, the mills were at, in full operation. Um, Paul Bunyan was pretty active. <laughs> there was a, a, a lot of uh, extraction happening. And then post-extraction, <clears throat> excuse me, you had the reforestation <clears throat> industry that was built around uh, old growth logging. So the, um, the service forestry industry built. When I started out in 1987 in the town of Ashland, the Safeway would ha had 20 vans of tree planting uh, companies because of the amount of clear cutting and logging and road building and extraction that w was happening really from, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, but a scale up in the 70s and 80s. So things were booming. People had nice new trucks, homes were being built. Um, a town of 5,000 in Ashland uh, became a town of 20,000. So with the bust of that economy, and it's not a blame game, their, their nature expressed itself through the Northern Spotted Owl, uh, a warning. Here's a warning sign, you're going too far. Impacts on aquatic systems, impacts on salmon. So there was a transition from an extractive economy to this restoration model that we're moving into. It's, it's making a living, not a killing. So uh, a, a lot of young people in these rural communities are moving away. One thing about the tribal communities we work with, tribal communities are not moving away as much because they're connected to their land base but there is economic disparity. So the building that restoration economy is, is, the, is the focus, but it does need to be subsidized. Um, a lot of these acres are very expensive. 
they're they're not going to pay their way out of the woods like back in the day by cutting big trees. So as we redefine these economic um, frames and and abilities to get this work done on the ground, leveraging investments, federal dollars, but also being able to utilize materials like we saw in that uh, video and bring value back to do the work through biomass or what we call ecological forestry byproducts, we, we can build that economy and creating a, a holistic approach to how we build that economic base within those rural communities. So people are actually excited to care for their land, to stay home, to raise their families. And we're seeing more and more of that as these infusions of resources come to care for the land. And often you'll hear, well, you know, it doesn't pay its way out of the woods. Well, roads need to be um, maintained. Our whole infrastructure has to be subsidized. Ecosystem services is part of that infrastructure. This water we're drinking today, these lights we have on, the air we're breathing outside. So that economy is being built as we speak. It is a restoration economy is, is what we're calling it. So where we lose our mills, I, I come from a very rural uh, county, Modoc County. I lived in Harney County, Oregon, and Lake County, Oregon. So when the mills shut down, that bust, is when folks just really didn't know what to do and the diversification of the economic base just wasn't there. Our county commissioners, our supervisors, our leaders, they only catered to the ag and the timber. And so that's that planning that needs to happen. And uh, even uh, who in here has filled out a USA jobs application? That's a whole year course in itself, right? <laughs> so that's what we're training our youth to do too. I mean, with all this training now, uh, you need to be trained in how to fill out a USA jobs application so you can get these jobs in the agencies or um, and do this kind of work. So being able to be nimble and pivot quickly to what are we, what are we gonna do with this skill set now, I think is really important. And then uh, incubating businesses, I think, uh, out of our budget this year, which we're just getting ready to approve, I think $7 million, correct me if I'm wrong, Marco, is going out to sub-awards. That's a huge opportunity for businesses and for incubation of business, especially with our Latinx, Latino communities, and with our tribal businesses. It's really important because they are place-based, they are going to be there. And with these master stewardship agreements from the Forest Service, the beauty of those is the restoration byproducts, which are the logs, the ecological thinning, the logs that we get to the mill. Those timber receipts go back into those local communities and back into that local workforce. So that's one of the reasons that we really like that master stewardship agreement. Our mantra from the east side in Oregon and northeastern California is we want our people, our children, working on our local public lands. And 80% of our land base in Modoc County, then you go up into Oregon, Harney County, Lake County, 80% of our land base is public lands. And I know the old guard, it's like, we don't want a government handout. That's how I was raised. You don't take anything from the government, you know? And that's something that I had to question as I got older. Well, 80% of our land base is federal government land. <laughs> they better be anteing up here and helping, helping us manage this land base because it wasn't being managed correctly. So I think the incubation of businesses, tribal businesses, the people that are implementing the work on the land, the boots on the ground, and then really thinking and planning for how do we pivot into building those restoration economies where all we depended on before was maybe that mill or ag in our community. So it's really a different way, different day, different time and place, and hopefully the right people to, to make those changes. Hi, um, I, I listen to all your presentations and it's always so inspiring and impressive. And today I want to ask you, do you have some type of um, employee resource platform? I'm thinking of people, communities, businesses that desperately need the type of workers who can provide the types of skilled services that you are training young people to do. Oh, and by the way, they need to be young people and uh, does not require a multi-page US jobs application and that is the nonprofit sector and the private sector. Um, I'm thinking of positions in land stewardship where a part of the um, employment would possibly include a place to live. 
um, possibly a vehicle to drive. So how do we connect with some of these skilled workers? Is there a way to do that? Are you developing it? Well, going back to we go where we're invited, usually those in, uh, communities invite us in, and then especially for tribes, we, we build that labor pool. Um, the, the real goal is that Loma Katsi can slip out the back door at the end of the day and it becomes that community's labor pool, that community's project, and they take credit for that job well done. We've just helped empower, train, impart our knowledge to build that. So it, the, it begins with an ask, and then uh, we can provide technical assistance, we can provide the model. Um, within your own community, you probably have some resources, and I would really uh, encourage everybody just that asset-based community development define identify your resources within your own community who could do that work is there anybody doing any inkling of the work that Loma Kotze is doing and then being able to build on that so and that's the other thing is just really encourage everybody look to look at the assets to build on the assets of your community and then being able to see who can do what who's interested in that and it doesn't, we provide programs for the young people, the young adults up to 35. However, for in incubating businesses, that could be anybody. Anybody could incubate a business. This is a 28 year old nonprofit. And that's what I tell folks too. You know, a lot of people, it's like, well, who do we need here? The people that have really made a difference, and, I, and some of them we communicated, some of the nonprofits, Jen. I mean, these nonprofits pop up after a crisis because they understand that the governments can't come help them immediately. So the nonprofits are much more nimble, much more able to adapt and be quick to respond. So again, look to your nonprofits, look to your educators, look to every asset that you have in your community. And then these tools are available, however you want to build that for your own local community. And then it's going to look like yours at the end of the day. So yeah, there, 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 these, these assets exist uh, in communities that really need the help. We have one uh, tribal community that actually where we live, um, the Fort Bibble Indian community, they have 3,500 uh, acres that borders Forest Service. Uh, they had the barns fire last year. Fortunately, only burned 7,000 acres because the wind shifted on Forest Service lands and touched the reservation. Uh, Could have burned the whole reservation and the non-native community to the ground. Um, it, it was kind of a, an act of, of hope that shifted that fire, but the community woke up again and had requested um, Lomakatsi to support. So we've actually imported uh, a tribal workforce uh, with the support of the tribal council, and then over time would be to build their own technical capacity, so that's foresters, archaeologists, and then their labor pool, and then also uh, incubating those businesses, helping businesses form but you have to build a large landscape scale initiative. So we're looking at a 20,000 acre project. That's the first step. We have a large project. We have a place where people can work for a long time, a major need, and then all the different disciplines and activities needed to get that work done. And then a workforce development program is layered into projects that are actively happening on the ground. It's not just a training program where the youth go away. We're employing the youth in our organization after or we're helping them get uh, placed in their tribe, or for a federal agency, she mentioned USA Jobs, how can we assist in that? So um, those, those uh, technical assistance opportunities exist, and we, we have a model to support that, but it's local knowledge. Tucker's got a great example of building an organization now. Entrepreneurial nonprofits are really key. Well, thank you so much. We used up the time, but obviously we were riveted, so thank you. And Julie, we're gonna we're gonna learn from this and try to get something started locally here based on that. So with that, I want to thank you. And I forgot to mention that you Marco has been on the board of After the Fire for consistently, and also Judy Coffee was here. So I didn't mention that earlier. But thank you so much for serving After the Fire and participating today. Thank you.